today we're going to continue uh, the series in 1 John that I started a couple of weeks ago. So you can turn to that letter, that short epistle, not the Gospel of John, but the, uh, the letter toward the very end of, the, of your Bibles. It's written by the Apostle John, uh, as were the other two uh, epistles, two, second and third. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as was the, uh, the book of Revelation and, of course, the Gospel that, that bears his name as well. Just as a bit of recap from the first four verses we looked at two weeks ago, uh, John is writing to believers. He's not writing to uh, people who don't know the Lord, but people who do. Um, he doesn't uh, give an introduction of himself. He doesn't give a, a list of his credentials or his resume or anything like that, the way that uh, Paul frequently does in the beginning of his letters, um, probably because he had no need to. He was writing to people who were familiar with him, possibly uh, at Ephesus, where he spent a number of years later in his life uh, teaching and working for the gospel. And he hits on some, uh, some fundamental aspects of what it means to live uh, a life under the Lord with truth and unity, which was conveniently followed up last week, um, fellowship and walking and the simplicity of the gospel and truth at the bottom of it all. Uh, John is referred to as the apostle of love by, by a lot of folks and for good reason. He talks about love a lot. He's uh, the disciple that Jesus loved. He talks about how love is the foundation of relationship with each other in the church. But beyond, underneath all of that is truth. And so in, as I study more and more about John, he seems more and more to me like the apostle of truth. And that's what he gets at in the first part of 1 John. He initiates this letter by talking about um, the truth and who Jesus was and what he did and the fact that he was a witness to it, he and others. And it's important that he does this because we're at the point he writes this letter a couple of generations removed from um, the time that Jesus actually walked the earth. So roughly 60-ish years after that fact. So a lot of the folks who saw Jesus and spent time with him, uh, witnessed him, they're not around anymore. And as we discussed, when there's a void of truth, then lies tend to come and fill that void. And that's what's happened, particularly in, in Ephesus, where early Gnostic teaching has been taking over. And they would argue that Jesus didn't really come in the flesh, um, that he was some kind of a semi-corporeal being, um, making the mistake that thinking that the flesh and its sinfulness would overwhelm God, rather than the fact that God's nature would overwhelm the sinfulness of the flesh. So John's writing to counter all that. Um, among other things. And he's writing as a witness, not just for himself. This is not a way to, to pump himself up or to give himself a pat on the back. He's writing this for others. Um, we see that he writes, I'm writing this for you so you can have fellowship with us. We want to have fellowship together and then together with God also. Our fellowship is with God and with his son, Jesus Christ. And that fellowship, as we ended two weeks ago in verse four, should lead to joy. A fellowship should lead to joy. So that lack of quarreling and that unity and that fellowship we have with each other because of our bond in Jesus Christ should lead to joy. I've said it several times before, and I'll say it many times again, that Christianity is not a lone wolf religion. There's very little about the Christian life that is meant to be done in isolation. <clears throat> Even the words of Christ in Matthew 6, where he talks about the, the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing and to go and pray privately in your room, unlike the Pharisees, even those things are not truly done in private because they're done before the Lord, who is the focus and the source of our fellowship with each other. Our lives are meant to be lived together. Our walk, as John puts it in the verses we're going to read this morning, is to be together, not a lonely one, but in fellowship with each other and joyful fellowship. Our relationships with each other, church, are supposed to be joyful. It should give us a grin and a, and a leap of happiness in our hearts when we see each other. If you were to Joe Shea's memorial service yesterday, you missed a lot of examples of what that joy is like when somebody lives a life that's pointed at Jesus. <clears throat> it was wonderful to hear. And this is, this is one of those great benefits of, of being a pastor is that you get to see the joy that manifests when people live around each other under the Lord. But you don't have to be a pastor to see it. You should all see this all the time. <clears throat> and if you don't see it, you're not in close enough fellowship with each other. <clears throat> yes, there are going to be pains and struggles and heartache and broken parts. Of course there are. But there is a greater joy. And that's what John is getting at and why he's sharing this. 
I was speaking with my life group last week about what's going to happen in a few weeks when we, when we depart. Um, we've been talking about this for a while, that the group needs a leader of some kind, somebody who not just can orchestrate when and where we meet, but also to lead discussion and that kind of thing. And somebody asked me if I had found someone to step in and lead, and I said I hadn't yet. And then I said, you know, would they be okay with kind of breaking apart and going and joining some of the other groups that are going in the church? And the answer was no. We're not breaking up. This group stays together. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so if you want to lead a life group, you know. <laughs> it was immediate and it was clear. And it, uh, it wasn't because we're afraid of change. <clears throat> but because we truly enjoy our time together. We have joy in that fellowship. Which is not to say that we can't have joy in other relationships with other people in the church, but there's something about that group that's been getting together every week to, to eat and to talk and to pray and to study scripture for months and months and months that's irreplaceable without a lot more effort. And that effort is good to make, but I understand not wanting to have to redo it. There's a specialness about that kind of thing where we are spending time in each other's lives. We are encouraging each other to be more Christ-like. We are confessing our sins before each other so that we can pray for and be prayed for. We're able and willing to do that and to joyfully sing out to God together. That is a good thing. So when John says that he wants our or your joy to be full in verse 4, that's the kind of thing he's talking about, that kind of inseparable joy. We should want to be around each other because we remind each other about Jesus. We should cling to that. We should be needy for each other's fellowship. Because it's not weakness. That is the strength of the church. And often we can let the world convince us that that's weak or convince us that we don't need it, that we can go it alone. To which I would say baloney and which Jesus would say wrong. <clears throat> that interaction, that, that living together is at the heart of the Christian life. John is telling this message to the believers that he's writing to, and the Lord is telling it to us through this text. And so John's going to boil it down to a pretty simple concept here in verse 5 as we move forward. He says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Lord, help us not to lie. <laughs> Thank you for this time we get to spend in your word, Lord. Speak to us through it, please, not through me. Help us to understand you more deeply, that we may have a closer fellowship with you and therefore with one another. It's our shared bond as your children. Thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself, that you have provided witnesses and accounts, Lord, so that we can have a truth to keep turning back to. And thank you, Lord, for your dwelling in our hearts that binds us together. Lord, help us to know you better through the text this morning. Amen. So John began this epistle by clarifying and verifying and emphasizing that Jesus was real, that he really did live and walk the earth. And John now shifts and turns to how we ought to respond to that reality, to that truth. Because the fact is that for God to become man is such a such a profound and extreme and severe thing to do that it deserves some kind of response. We can't just ignore that. <clears throat> and the repeated emphasis in what John is writing about here is that what we do, what we say in response matters. The things we say and we do are important because they confirm our hearts. You know, John the Baptist spent his life preparing the way of the Lord and uh, testifying and prophesying what the coming Messiah saying that one mightier than he was coming. As he puts it in Luke 3.16, he says, Jesus is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Verse 17 says, His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is not an ordinary man, John says. He is extraordinary. This guy can do things that nobody else can do. He has authority that nobody else has. 
He's different, and he's going to judge the world. That's what John the Baptist says about Jesus, and his words were confirmed by his actions. He spent his life declaring and professing the truth about Christ, even to the point of death. John's actions and his words confirm the truth that our apostle John, who wrote this letter, is so concerned with. We're supposed to have joy in that truth that John's been talking about. What is that message? What is that truth that God provided for us? Jesus was real. He did and said and spoke and all these things. Well, what did he say? Verse 5 tells us, this is the message we have heard from him. So this is the thing we've been waiting for. This is the thing that's going to spur us to have joy. And we declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's the whole message. You can go home now. (laughs) Only if John stopped there. (laughs) You summarize all of Jesus' teaching and preaching and actions and miracles and boil it all down, and what do you get? God is light. That's the truth upon which everything else is built. Straight from Jesus' mouth, John says, because we heard this from him. And we're not just sharing this or recollecting this, we're declaring this to you. It's an important word he uses. It comes from the Greek angelos, where we get angel or messenger. We're purposed with sharing this with you, not something we casually mention as a side part of the conversation, but it's our intent and our purpose and our mission to share this with you. So we're declaring to you this basic fact that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And so those of us who are seasoned in the church might say, okay, whoop de doo right? We know that. God's good. Great. Christianity 101, right? <clears throat> Standard stuff. But this is one of those places where John, the apostle of truth, is in pretty fine form as a writer. I love his clarity and his succinctness here. He says, God is light. Three words. Not similar to light. Not, shall I compare thee to a summer's day. (laughs) God's not like light. He's not a a pretty good substitute for light, the way that the store brand Dr. Pepper is a decent facsimile. (laughs) God is light. He's the real deal. And we could spend a lot of time talking about how God is light. We could turn to Psalm 36, 9, or John 1, 9, and a whole bunch of other places. But beyond that, not only is he light, but in him there is no darkness at all. None. Not a bit, not a sliver. He's not a little bit dark when he's grumpy, you know, in between meals, or when the Mariners lose again and again and again. (laughs) I know, it hits close to home. (laughs) But no darkness at all. It's important that we take a minute and think about how remarkable that is. I mean, how much darkness is in you? Yeah, there we go. (laughs) Me too. How much darkness is in the kindest, most compassionate, gracious person you've ever met? Not none. But in God, there's none. God is so perfectly holy that there is no darkness in him at all. And nothing else is like that. Not a thing. And this idea is is all over scripture. You can go back to another of John's writing in his gospel in chapter 3 where uh, Jesus is met by Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a leader. And he comes to Jesus in darkness. So how's that for a metaphor for you? He comes to Jesus in darkness under cover of night and Jesus is light to him. And he says to him in verse 19 there, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Note particularly verse 20 there, which says that, Everyone practicing evil hates the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. What the light does is is it makes darkness stand out. It makes evil stand out. You bring out the light, and evil is exposed. You bring out the truth, and lies are exposed. It takes light to defeat darkness. Our house is almost 100 years old, and like any old house, it's not exactly the most weather-tight or animal-tight building. And uh, last winter, one night I went to bed, and I wear a CPAP machine to help my sleep apnea, and so there's always some noise from the, the pump and the, the airflow. But I could, I could just barely hear where that, this, this sound, it was like... 
and I stop and I hear it again. And I take my mask off and I wait and I don't hear it. I put my mask back on and there it is. Go. And I'm like, what is that? But eventually I put it out of mind. I go to sleep. But the next night I hear the same thing before I put my mask on. And, and I start moving around the bedroom and, and I go out the doorway and I'm pretty sure it's coming from the kitchen. But every time I get close to it, it stops. And, and then I step back and it happens again. And this goes on for days. <laughs> Sometimes it's in the kitchen, sometimes it's in the bedroom, sometimes it's in the dining room, but it's always... And so I put mouse traps out, right? I put bait out. I search for holes in the foundation room when I got in, and I, I can't find anything. And night after night, for weeks. And then one night, I wake up about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I hear a different sound. And I'm like, what is that? like little tiny claws that can't get traction on the floor. And I think, this is my chance. <laughs> so I jump out of bed. You ever get out of bed so, with so much like adrenaline that you're just kind of berserk? <laughs> I grab the thing that's closest to me, which happens to be a slipper, <laughs> and I run out in the kitchen, and, and I hear this noise. And so I jump where I think it is, and I, I bring that slipper down with all the force I've got, and nothing. That wool slipper had never moved so fast in its life. <laughs> so I stop and I hear it again. It's over in the corner. So I dive after it. I hit my shoulder on the fridge because it's dark. I can't see anything. And then it's in the bedroom. I hear it skittering around on the floor. It like, can't get traction on the tile. And I'm thinking, I got him where I want him. And so I chase him around the bedroom. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I step on the dog. I, I wake the baby up. I wake Anna up. I slip in the laundry. I mean, I'm like red-faced and sweaty and berserk, and I cannot get this stupid mouse, right? And then I hear Anna behind me go, Marcus, turn the light on. <laughs> and I'm like, what? She goes, turn the light on. So I flip the light on, and there he is. He's sitting on the other slipper <laughs> right in front of me. <laughs> I had been hearing him scratching around in the darkness for weeks and then chased him around my house in the middle of the night to no avail in the darkness. And I flipped the light on, and he's right there. So we'll just say that I took care of him. Um, <laughs> and I felt better after that. But what a difference some light makes, right? It makes our fruitless efforts in the dark much more useful because we can see what we're aiming at <clears throat> with a slipper. <laughs> the light exposes what's been taunting us. That's what light does for our lives. And we can choose to go chasing down lies one by one in the darkness, smashing wildly at things we can't quite see, or we can use the light and take careful aim and look at the truth that's right in front of us. Light gives us clarity. And yet for some reason, we frequently forget about that. We spend so much of our time debating the darkness instead of basking in the light. Jesus speaks about a lamp unto our feet, unto a path, in John 8, 12, he says he's the light of the world. He calls us to be a light in 1 Peter 3 and other places. Paul's commission from Jesus on the road to Damascus that he recounts in Acts 26 was to go and to be a light to the Gentiles, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, to turn them from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The same people that John's writing to, and that He's saying to them, we want to have this kind of fellowship to share this inheritance in fullness of joy in the light. <clears throat> and that's why, he says, we're declaring to you about how God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And notice there's no couching here. John is not a man to play with whimsy or vagaries. He's very clear. This is an absolute. This is certain. God is light. And there is no darkness at all. And there's no darkness in his fellowship. So when we get to verse 6, and John says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, we know that that's a certainty too. Verse 5 told us there's no darkness in God at all. Verse 6 tells us that when we're walking in darkness, we're not really having fellowship with him. Because darkness isn't with God. We're lying. And we're also, therefore, not having fellowship with each other. When we get to chapter 2, eventually, we're going to see that John uses the same kind of construction in verses 9 and 10 and 11 there. 
he uses logical statements. He's dealing with stone-cold facts and stone-cold truth. And so he uses the most basic of the logical statements, which is, if this, then that. That's the construction he uses here. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, but then walk in darkness, then we are liars. John's very plain. It's almost mathematical. But there's something else going on here besides just the surface logic, which is that he's sharing with us some more truth. He's saying, walking in darkness undermines having fellowship with God. It counteracts it. It's the opposite of it. Saying we have fellowship does not mean we have fellowship. Saying we have fellowship does not mean we have fellowship. The things that we say and do shed light on our hearts. When we walk in darkness, we can prove otherwise. So we can say we have fellowship with God. We can go to church. We can put cheesy bumper stickers on our car. We can wear T-shirts with pictures of Jesus as a soccer goalie that says, Jesus saves. <laughs> it's okay, right? Yeah. <laughs> we can profess our faith until we're blue in the face. But if we walk in darkness, we're liars. <clears throat> no exceptions. Our walk indicates what's in our hearts. Our walk, not our mouths, indicates what's in our heart. And so if that walk is in darkness, we're liars. But fortunately, if that walk is in the light, as verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. How's that for a bonus on top of the fellowship? So if we walk in the darkness, we're liars about our fellowship. But if we walk in the light, we're in fellowship with each other. And our fellowship, as John said in verse 3, is with each other and with God. Amen. And we know there's no darkness in God at all, and so to make it so we can be in fellowship with him, he cleanses us from all sin. That should overwhelm us. <laughs> it should overwhelm us. And we should notice, too, that it's only by walking in the light that we have fellowship with each other. We can't have fellowship with each other if we're not walking in the light, church. Not true, good fellowship. And we see this all the time on the outskirts of the church, but, but in the middle of it, too. One of the things we do at our Monday staff meeting every week is we, we think about who wasn't there on Sunday. And I don't, I don't mean to alarm you. We're not, we're not keeping attendance, and we're not you know, trying to scold anybody or shame anyone. We do it because we want to know where the sheep are. <laughs> it's important. Because one of the first signs of not walking in the light is a lack of fellowship. Because sin naturally brings with it shame. And as Jesus told us, darkness wants to hide from light, lest it be exposed. Well, this is a pretty bright place. <clears throat> and so if someone's gone for a couple of weeks and we know they're not sick or on vacation or something, we kick it up a notch, and we pray more, and we call, and we go visit. Not so that we can shame them into coming back to church, but to see if they're okay. So they can be restored in fellowship. It's hard to have fellowship when we're not walking in the light. It's a warning sign. And John says we can't have it unless we're walking in the light. <clears throat> he says to walk in the light as he, as Jesus, is in the light. And walking is one of those... Um, quiet but vital subjects in Scripture. It, it, there's nothing fancy but the word. It literally means to walk, to travel, to, to move, to cover ground. And it's important to remember that just as our Christian life is not solo, it's not a lone wolf effort, it's also not stagnant. We never stand still. We are always going somewhere. <clears throat> our lives are a walk. And you know, if, if, like me, you didn't grow up in the church, it can be very confusing to hear that. You come to church and start hanging out with churchy people who say stuff like, how's your walk with the Lord? And you go, I don't know what that means. Is he supposed to be like, am I supposed to take him for a walk? Does he take me for a walk? Like, who's got the leash on, you know? <laughs> but the walk is not next to him on a sidewalk, of course, right? It's with the Holy Spirit inside and with the Father in mind and with the Son in sight. The Spirit inside and the Father in mind, and the Son in sight. <clears throat> the Spirit to guide us and instruct us and convict us, and the Father in mind in prayer, and the Son whose life is in sight as the goal of our own striding. He's shown us and illuminated our path. You can almost hear the, the pleading of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 2, verse 5 of, of his book, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Please, he's saying, please let us walk in the light of the Lord. 
or else he'll get to you later. But walk in the light of his glory and his grace and not in darkness, right? Sometimes the power is going to go out. <laughs> Sometimes the clouds will roll in. <clears throat> we can let that darkness get to us, but the overall walk is in the light. Our deeds are exposed. They're not hidden. <clears throat> Where does that light come from? Jesus says he's the light of the world. I mentioned that in John's Gospel, chapter 8. Whoever follows him won't walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And if we're walking in it, John writes, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Another conditional statement, more logic. If, then. So does that mean that we're destined to go to hell if we don't live perfect lives? <clears throat> it means our walk, our travel, our moving forward is in the light. <clears throat> it's exposed for others to see, and it means they're going to see the mistakes. Because those mistakes are made in the light and not in the darkness. And when they're made in the light, there's forgiveness. And there's opportunity to pray for each other about them and to help each other. <clears throat> not so in the darkness because there's no fellowship in the dark. And because of that, he cleanses us from all sin when we're living in the light. And that's another absolute from John, another certainty. He says all sin. Not some sin, not the ones that are easy to remember or the ones we remember to tell them about or... Um, the ones that others remind us of, <laughs> but all sin. We walk in the light and practice the truth, the truth being who Jesus was and is and what he said and did and commanded for us to do. We're cleansed. And so you begin to see how intertwined these things are. The human brain desires order, some of us more than others. It wants clarity and patterns. It wants you know, action A to lead to result B. And here we have things so beautifully and complexly and also simply intertwined. Walking in the light and fellowship with him and fellowship with each other and cleansing from sin are all intertwined here. Very simply, but there's also a lot going on. But you can't have it piecemeal. You can't separate it all. It's not an a la carte kind of thing. Christianity is not a lone wolf religion. It's not a stagnant religion, and it's not a piecemeal religion. You don't get to have only the light, or only the fellowship, or only the cleansing from sin. <clears throat> They're part and parcel of each, of each other. You get the whole thing, or you get none of it. And this is part of the danger of the age we're in. People want grace without repentance, or mercy without justice, <clears throat> or God without Jesus or the Holy Spirit without Jesus. But we don't get to pick and choose what aspects of God we want to experience, which is hard for us because we can custom order anything else in our lives, pretty much. and It'll show up in two days, <clears throat> but not God. He has instead made us a simple and stupendous offer, a self-sacrificing offer of payment through his own blood for our eternal souls because of our sin. And we can either choose to accept it or choose to decline it, but there's no bargaining there's no piecemealing. And why would we want anything except the fullness of God, which dwelt in Jesus bodily, as Colossians 2.9 says. The fullness of God was in Jesus, a perfect example of and in the light. So it's simple in that sense. We just follow him. <laughs> but what John is addressing is people who they don't want to follow. They want to lead. And the people he's writing to, the church that they're in and the age that they're in is, is experiencing these uh, distractions and false teaching, people who are beginning to try and add and subtract from the teachings and the understanding of who Jesus is. And in doing so, they're not just making adjustments to him because you can't adjust to Jesus. They're throwing him out. You can't dismantle and rearrange and reconfigure who Jesus is. It doesn't work like that. <clears throat> They won't follow Jesus as he was from the beginning, which was seen and looked upon and handled and heard and witnessed. And so they won't walk in the light of life. We see that example in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let me ask you a simple question, church. Who gets to say whether or not we have sin? 
You'd say God, of course, right? It's not a trick question. <laughs> and you'd be right. And, if I, and then if I asked you, well, who sins? You'd quote me Romans 3.23, which says that all sin have fallen short of the glory of God because you know your scripture. Good job. I'm going to give you a gold star on the pat on the head, and that would be good. Um, <laughs> but those statements are based on a fact that not everybody takes for granted, which is that sin even exists at all. Let me clarify here. John may be saying in this verse, we can put it back on the screen real quick, Angie. Um, John may be saying here, look, if if we deny that we've committed sin, if if we lie and say that we've been living perfectly without violating any kind of ethic, if we, then we're obviously liars because everybody sins. And we've certainly all seen or been around folks who, who believe that everything they touch turns to gold and everything they say is true and everything they do is right. People who don't believe that they need to repent because they don't think they've ever done anything wrong. They've only done right things. Well, that's one kind of pride. Another is the man who doesn't believe he's done anything wrong because there is no wrong. He believes there is no identifiable good and evil, right and wrong, no hard and fast moral ethic. <clears throat> Even some folks who proclaim themselves to be believers in God have that perspective, that, that nothing really finally is good or bad, that everything's relative, that Everything is just a matter of doing the best you can or of being true to yourself. I noticed that phrase a lot in the last few years. Be true to yourself. I feel like I'm yelling at clouds now, but give me a minute. But you see it in everything from, you know, soft drink advertisements to to post-game athlete interviews. Just being true to myself. That's the important thing. And the, the Christian who puts his trust in the Word of God looks at that and says, that's ridiculous. And, and, we can tend to think that's a result of the culture or the times that we're in, that you know, it's kids these days, things spiraling out of control and getting worse and worse and worse. Things were better the way they used to be. It's easy to, to look at our postmodern uh, society and see that as the problem. But as always, the problem is not the culture. The problem is the source of the culture, which is people, which is, in a very broad sense, us. And that idea of wiping away right and wrong of hard and fast truth is not a new thing. It was the same thing John was writing about 1930-some years ago. <clears throat> the essence of the Gnostic teaching that John's writing against there in, in Ephesus is, is that spirit is good, flesh is bad. And their response to that was to try to meld that somehow with Christianity, to overcome the gap with some kind of a compromise. A couple of times, or a couple of ways they tried it was through it's been called docetism, which surmised that Jesus was not really in the flesh at all. He was a spirit being only. That's why John spent so much time early on declaring that Jesus was real, that he was witnessed and held and touched and all these things. There's Serinthianism, which makes Jesus kind of a go-between, between existences, somebody who's both spirit or physical, and he can kind of transfer back and forth. But they're trying to bridge a gap between themselves and, and Jesus that compromises who he is. They're trying to compromise Jesus in order to make it easier to understand. But both those approaches diminish the deity of who Christ is, and they diminish the distinction between right and wrong, and the distinction between good and evil, and the distinction between sin and righteousness by by painting them as something that even Jesus had had to deal with and work around, that he was somehow subjugated to them. They said that what Jesus did was to blur the line between sin and righteousness, just as he blurred it between sin and flesh and kind of managed to be both sort of. But what in fact he did was to draw that line definitively in the sand with a sword. I was going to say sharpie, and that wasn't a strong enough metaphor. And keep in mind, this is only a couple generations after Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And already there are these wild ideas trying to reconcile death and life by adjusting who Jesus is rather than who we are. We are so selfish. <laughs> that should be a huge red flag. When we believe that, that our approach to God has to be paved by, by changes in who God is rather than who we are, something has gone horribly wrong with our understanding. <clears throat> and that self-righteousness, is, it's not new. Just as the idea of being true to yourself is not a new thing that we're just dealing with now. It was an issue in John's day. It was an issue before then. It was an issue since then. You're probably familiar with the phrase, there's nothing new under the sun. 
You may even know that it comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, which reads, That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new about wanting to blur the line between good and evil. Or to give rid of those concepts altogether and believe that the only thing that matters is the self. It's an old idea. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes is an awesome book with some incredible insight in the human condition and mind. And one of its constant refrains is that all is vanity or hevel, grasping at wind. And I love that illustration because I just I imagine the folly of human desire to try and grab hold of the wind somehow <clears throat> when it's God who makes it blow and knows its course. It's a picture of how we're often about the wrong things, we're trying to get what we can't get instead of focusing on what is good and right. It's never God who has to change. It's us. <clears throat> so is John saying that if we deny, we commit sins, or if he's saying if we deny that sin even exists? Well, either one is a huge problem. Either one is a huge problem. If sin doesn't exist, and that's why we don't sin, then what's the point of a Savior? You don't need one. You only need the self. And so then Jesus gets transformed in, in that way of thinking from the holy anointed one, the, the Son of God, perfect Lord and Savior, into some kind of a, a, a kindly homeless orator, you know, a good teacher who's got some crafty sayings but doesn't add up to anything more than a wise man at worst or a ghost at best. And the great fallacy of these ways of thinking is that they make Jesus either unnecessary or insufficient when the truth is that we need all of him to save us. Look at the end of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Again, simple complexity. Verse 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. There's no hemming and hawing before God. You can convince a man what's good and evil and vice versa, but you can't convince God. We need a Savior, and so if we say that we have no sin, as John writes, if we say that, whether it's because we don't think we sin or because we don't think there is sin at all, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And when the truth is in us, and Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and the Holy Spirit dwells within believers, when that truth is in us, we, we won't, we can't deceive ourselves and say that we have no sin. Instead, we'll be prompted by the Spirit to live like in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our lives should be marked by confession. <clears throat> this is part of the joy of being in fellowship with each other, is confessing our sins <clears throat> in the light before God and before our brothers and sisters, knowing that his blood is sufficient for the cleansing of all unrighteousness and to be in the open and be prayed for. That's one of the beauties of fellowship. When our lives are in the light, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. It's another certainty. He both forgives and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. See, when we approach the Lord as, as filthy, as dirty in our sin, he doesn't just forgive us and shoo us on our way. He cleanses us. He goes a step farther. He washes us with his blood, removes our sin, takes it away, overcomes it, pays for it, justifies us. He doesn't forget to wash behind our ears so that there's some lingering stink of sin. <laughs> How much righteousness does it say he cleanses us of? All of it. Not just the sins that we remember or the ones we're even aware of. <clears throat> His forgiveness is complete. And that sounds, that sounds lovely. Like, I'll take that. But it goes back to that logic again. If, then. If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just. If. Proverbs 28, 13 reminds us that he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. <clears throat> and Psalm 32 says, starting in verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you 
and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. My son asks me, how do I say I'm sorry to God? (laughs) I can only think of two answers to give him. One is in Matthew 6, to pray as Jesus taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer, one of the lines of which is, forgive us our trespasses. The other is in the preceding chapter where Jesus tells his disciples not to pray on the street corners as the Pharisees do for everybody to see, but to go and do so privately to God. But Jesus doesn't tell us what to say. He doesn't give us a formula. He doesn't say, you know, go sit in a wooden box with a curtain between you and a priest and recite this script and make these certain hand motions. He simply says to pray. How to pray is a worthy question and a worthy exploration to do another time. For the moment, suffice it to say, we're, we're told to pray many times and to confess. And we know the Lord knows everything that's happened and what's in our hearts. Uh, Psalm 139 says, You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. So we can't provide him with information when we pray, when we confess, though it's good for us to be reminded of what we recognize as sin in our lives. But what we're to provide him with in prayer and confession is, is a broken and a contrite heart, as Psalm 51 calls it. God's not first concerned with whether we can remember the specifics of our sin. There are too many for us to know anyway. But whether our hearts are turned to him, can we honestly tell him in prayer that our desire is to be in the light and plead with him to let us be so? And God's first concern is not that our actions look like Jesus, but that our heart does. And the actions will follow. We know this. And the things we say will follow too. And when we confess our sins, when we confess that sin even exists, he is faithful and just because he always holds up his end of the bargain. We don't always. Verse 10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We cannot come before God, we can't even come before men and say, we haven't sinned. And again, you have the logic there. If we say we haven't sinned, then his word is not in us. So only those who have his word in them can say that they haven't sinned. Nobody who has God, sorry, excuse me, Nobody who has God can say they haven't sinned. Not because God makes us sinners, right? But because the light opens our eyes and we can no longer abide with falsehoods. We can deceive ourselves into thinking we're without sin, but we cannot deceive God. We can believe that something is true or untrue, but it won't change the truth. And, and that's been a really important piece of growth in my understanding of the past few years is understanding that what someone says or does has no effect on what is true. God is true whether someone believes in him or not. I have a couple of people in my circle who are adamantly anti-God, but their unbelief doesn't make God untrue. And that is, in the end, what John keeps coming back to, is the truth, the simple truth. Life is folly without the truth in us. We lie to others if the truth isn't in us. We lie to ourselves if the truth isn't in us. We make God out to be a liar if the truth isn't in us. This makes me want to have the truth in me. There are things that I don't fully understand about Scripture and truth and God, things I have not puzzled out. And from the outside, it can seem like I'm an insane person devoting my life in the next few years especially, to something that I don't fully understand. And I get that. I do. I love to have information. I want to know everything before I make a decision. <clears throat> but what continues to drive me back to studying the Word and back to prayer and preaching and fellowship with other believers is what I do know. That God is good, that I am not, that Jesus lived and died and rose again, and that the Holy Spirit dwells in me and my desire to understand the mysteries of God more deeply. And so we continue to seek the truth. That's why we gather. That's why we pray with each other. That's why we study together. That's what our fellowship is for, to grow closer. So where do we get it? 
In John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus is responding to the disciples' concerns about his impending death. He tells them not to let their hearts be troubled, and he tells them to believe in him just as they believe in God, and he tells them in verse 6 that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And it goes on in verse 16 to say that he will send a helper to abide with us forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, he says, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Believe in me, Jesus says, and you will have truth in you. It is a remarkably simple solution to what the world wants to make out to be a remarkably complex problem. But it's so simple. Believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God, God himself made flesh, not some mystic go-between or an astral projection or a pretty good dude, but God himself, who came and lived a perfect life that we can set our eyes on and was seen by many, who died and rose again. He is the light, and in him is no darkness at all. Walk in him. That's the message, John says, that we have heard from him and declare to you so that your joy may be full. Simple message and a gift. I encourage you to think about what you've heard from him in your study in the word, in your fellowship with each other, to think about what you're declaring because you are to be declarers. <clears throat> and as you leave this day from this place to, to think about whose joy you're going to help make full by declaring what you've heard from him. I pray that the truth would light our way this week, church, as we go out of this place in a world that is dark. It needs light. There's a simple way to get it. So let's share that with them, church, as we move forward. Lord, we thank you for being the light, for being perfection that we can't be, and for imparting your righteousness to us, Lord. That is a sacrifice that we simply don't deserve and cannot earn. Thank you, Lord, that we do not have to. Thank you for the truth and the simplicity of your message, of your gospel and scripture. Thank you for the complexity of your love toward us, even as it is boiled down to something so simple. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be lights as Christ commanded us to be. Help us to have light in us, help us to live in the light before you and before each other, confessing our sins and praying for each other and experiencing and understanding the cleansing of your blood. It's perfect, Lord. Thank you for that. We love you. Amen.